Does the audience have any questions? Yeah, I didn't really, I was trying to avoid sort of utopian systems um, for reading. I mean, the whole contra controlled vocabulary idea would be, oh, okay, well, you're gonna create a series of metadata tags um, or frames for particular kinds of reading experiences. And they're fairly rigid. Um, they resort to um, converting a lot of literature into sort of generic or communication forms. So I was really interested in, um, you know, what happens when um, literature as a sort of medium becomes sort of secondary to um, communications practices. And I think my interest in that was simply that we spend so much time today. Um, I mean, the sort of textual ecology has to do with, um, you know, there's just so much texting. I get most of my news through RSS feeds, that sort of stuff. So I wanted to align textual practices with, um, you know, with things having to do with how actual language is disseminated today. So in that sense, I was very interested in historicizing particular forms of reading, how it gets reading, how reading is done, um, you know, even the different kinds of, say, blog, um, blog sites. When I think of the beautiful, I think of uh, sort of Foucault's idea of the bureaucratization of the beautiful, and that's what's sort of present in the administered life worlds, I think, in seven control vocabularies. That's the kind of beauty you're getting. It's generic, it's highly processed, um, it's kind of vanilla-based, um, and yet there's a little bit of room for participation even in that, and I think maybe there's something mildly, um, there's something mildly, um, oh, I don't know, hopeful about that. We produce attention now, it's a commodity, um, and it's quite valuable. Um, and it's mined, and it's sold. And Google's very good at, um, at sort of manipulating these sorts of um, our attention and um, putting it to some use, monetary use. An emotion which is clearly possessed, you have an emotion, um, affects sort of pass through you, um, and an emotion is more readily as re rendered into a commodity, um, as Hollywood movies sort of clearly attest. And anyone who writes a book really, in some sense, is about, is engaged in that similar process of I mean, when I write a book of poetry, really, what's the intent? It's to provide someone with some sort of feeling um, or emotion, right? I mean, that's why people read, and that's what we do as writers. We try to give that to them in various ways. There was a really interesting piece that James Bridal did. He, um, and I mentioned it to Kareem, I, uh, but he took all the Wikipedia entries on the Iraq war in the last three years, and he published all of them in a series of nine volumes. And you could see how actively contentious the, um, the desire on various people's parts to nail down what the Iraq war was. But he published all the modifications and emendations of the text. It was, it's a beautiful, I think, brilliant project about um, the sort of contested space of authorship and ownership of the Iraq war as a sort of piece of intellectual property as well. The book was sort of about Heath Ledger and his death and how I received news about it through various RSS feeds and text messages which I'd sort of followed on some of the, um, the sort of um, news sites, the, you know, the celebrity news sites. Um, and so then Heath became very interesting for me because he was an actor, I mean literally an actor, but an actor in some sort of network system. And how his identity got defined within this network was really contingent on a series of many things like um, notions of identity that were emerging in this Asian American Writers Workshop class that I was teaching, but also, um, you know, I got sidetracked by Jackie Chan for some reason because, um, you know, I was just thinking, like, well, what levels, you know, Heath Ledger is usually presented as a sort of figure of interiority, right? He's a sort of, he's brooding, he's has a lot of depth, and of course, I just kept thinking of Jackie Chan because he's, you know, I, you know, and I, so I imported all these images of Jackie Chan hawking uh, green tea beverage, um, doing a kung fu move, you know, and so he just denied that kind of interiority that sort of Heath Ledger has uh, as a matter of course. Um, but of course, then I read all this stuff about Jackie Chan, and he's really into green tea and organic food and stuff, so, you know, there's a plateau there opening into other kinds of interiority that I wasn't even aware of. These used photographs, though, to illustrate landscapes where I grew up in southeastern Ohio, I found it actually quite easy to find sort of photographs that I thought were kind of vaguely analogous to the landscape where I grew up. And I always remember people say, like, oh, the landscape, the geographical landscape that you grew up with, that's the landscape you love for the rest of your life. And I think it was true for me. And so if I grew up in... Um, Someone's, someone's saying no back there. So, but the, uh, 
but, but I remember the landscape that I grew up in. It was sort of southeastern Ohio. It was hilly. It was this unglaciated region. And it's just like that landscape in that movie, The Silence of the Lambs, when he goes back and tries to look for the killer in the West Virginia hills. Well, that's the landscape I grew up with, and I really do love it. And so putting these photos, these black and white photos for me, was really, it was like creating a little personal photo album. It's highly affective, their use. But I think because all these images had to be scanned, rephotographed digitally, there was some sort of transposition from an analog to a digital state that I would sort of equate with the, it would be analogous to how consciousness functions, i.e. the transposition from an analog to a digital state is the system wherein I find or can understand this notion of what it means to remember something, i.e. consciousness itself. And the other thing I'd been reading a lot was, um, it was a book on television. Um, so Ron Lembo wrote a book called Rethinking Television, and um, he's a sociologist. It's sort of, an, uh, it's a sort of detailed empirical study of how people use television. And he divides viewers into curated viewers. I think sort of most of us are probably curated viewers. Like there's shows we want and we turn on the TV just to see those shows or we film them and we come back. But there's another group of uh, viewers who basically have the TV on like 24 hours a day, continuous viewers, he calls them. And I remember growing up in Ohio, the, our TV was on basically all the time from 3 o'clock until we went to bed. And... Um, <clears throat> So Lembo has a sort of complicated argument about, well, you know, in this case, you would think that maybe that when the TV is continually on and you become kind of passive or brain dead before the mechanism, I mean, that's sort of one of the underlying assumptions, and the TV is a kind of uh, form of, I don't know, ideological domination, that actually it turned out people's use of TV in a continuous use setting was actually far more complicated. They were switching channels quite a bit. They were using children in the room to change the channels, but this is before the era of remote control. And they were actually using TV in quite a sort of, it's not, I wouldn't say creative, but it was certainly not a, an entirely passive absorption of TV as a medium. And this, again, is something I think it would be useful to just throw out to the room at large, whether you know, we sort of inhabited a kind of cinematic space and then we inhabited a kind of televisual space. And now some people are saying we really live in a kind of um, socially networked interactive, interactive space, whether this is a, uh, in some sense a new media regime, which has altered the structure of feelings, as you allude to. Um, and, you know, Williams was sort of very careful in sort of uh, developing the idea of the structure of feelings as, you know, as a way of sort of indicating the sort of pro process-based notions of the mediatory apparatus as it sits. But what was sort of interesting was I thought, oh, well, GChat really functions very differently in terms of the um, conversational interlude, as it were, because when you make a phone call, right, you're calling someone and they answer. But when you're on GChat, you're kind of all available to talk, and the call's never made to actually instigate the conversation. But the call can be made by e either of the parties at any moment. So that's a different kind of conversational mode, I think. And this just in reference to, you know, uh, to Kristen's idea that, oh, maybe new structures of feeling are evolving with different technology.